وسلات وسلام الرسول اللہ وعلیٰ علی وصاب اجمعین اما آباد اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم کن تم خیر امت نخرجت للناس تعمرون بالمعروف و تنہون عن المنکر و تؤمنون باللہ رب شہلی صدری و یسرلی امری وحل العقدت من لسان یفقہ قولی دا ریسپیکٹڈ پیپل آن دا ڈائس مائی ریسپیکٹڈ ایلڈرز And my dear brothers and sisters, I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. May peace, mercy and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God, be on all of you. The topic of this evening's talk is the role of the Muslims in a non-Muslim society. First, let us understand what is the meaning of the word Muslim. Muslim means a person who follows Islam. Islam comes from the root word Salam, which means peace. It is also derived from the Arabic word Silm, which means to submit your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to Almighty God. In short, Islam means Peace acquired by submitting your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to Almighty God. And anyone who submits his will to Almighty God and acquires peace is called as a Muslim. So in short, Muslim is a person who acquires peace by submitting his will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to Almighty God. As far as the role of the Muslims in a non-Muslim society is concerned, it can be divided broadly into two categories. The first is the actions and deeds related to himself. And the other is the actions and deeds related to the non-Muslim. As far as the first category is concerned, that is the actions and deeds of a Muslim related to himself, it is the same irrespective whether that Muslim lives in a Muslim society or a non-Muslim society. The actions and the deeds are the same. There are certain concessions given in certain situations, but it does not differ whether the Muslim is living in a Muslim society or the non-Muslim society, it is the same. For example, what is fard? What is compulsory for a Muslim in a Muslim society is also fard, is also compulsory for a Muslim in a non-Muslim society. For example, every Muslim has to believe and worship only one Almighty God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Irrespective whether he's living in a Muslim society or a non-Muslim society, he should believe in Tawheed, he should worship only one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A Muslim has to pay five times a day, minimum, in a Muslim society. The same has to be done by that Muslim even if he lives in a non-Muslim society. Fine, there may be different situation. In a Muslim society, there may be a mosque in every area. There may be a mosque in every second street, which may not be the case in a non-Muslim society. But yet, if a Muslim is living in a non-Muslim society, he has to offer five times salah. It is compulsory, it is fard. If the mosque is not close by, or he has to travel long and he cannot do that, he has to offer salah maybe in his office or at home, but salah is fard. He has no excuse to miss it. A Muslim, irrespective whether he is living in a Muslim, or a non-Muslim society, he has to give zakat. If he is entitled to give, if he has a saving of more than the nisab level, more than 85 grams of gold, he or she should give 2.5% of that excess wealth, of that saving, every lunar year in charity. A Muslim cannot say that he's living in a non-Muslim society and the standard of living is high, or the place where he's living it is expensive, therefore he will not give zakat. 
if he has a saving of more than the nisab level 85 grams of gold he or she should give zakat every year a muslim irrespective of whether they're living in a muslim or non muslim society he has to fast in the month of ramadan if the days are short in winter maybe the timings will be less if it's in summer where the days are long the timing of the fast would be longer but he has to fast compulsory he has no excuse if he lives in non muslim society he has no excuse he has to fast similarly a muslim if he has the means to perform hajj if he is an adult he should at least perform hajj once in his lifetime if he has the means health and money he has to offer hajj there's no excuse even if he is living in a non muslim society he may be living far away from saudi arabia from makka but if he has the means to travel the distance he has to offer hajj at least once in his lifetime it is fard in this way all the farais all the actions and deeds which are compulsory for a muslim in a muslim society is also compulsory in a non muslim society a muslim woman she has to do hijab irrespective whether she living in a muslim or non muslim society she has no excuse that she is living in non muslim society that's the reason she will not do hijab there's no excuse so fard it has to be done in this way all the other farz being honest speaking the truth it is the same it does not differ similarly what is haram for a muslim in a muslim society is also haram for a muslim in a non muslim society whichever part of the world he lives in shirk is haram he is living in a muslim society it's also haram if he's living in a non muslim society there's no excuse that because he's staying in a non muslim society or a western country he can do shirk it's haram throughout the world similarly fornication and adultery it is haram for a muslim irrespective whether he's living in a muslim or non muslim society irrespective which part of the world he lives in pork is haram whether he lives in a muslim country or non muslim country having non zabia food non halal food any meat which is not sorted by the islamic method or which quran does not give permission to it is haram irrespective whether they living in a muslim or non muslim society in short whatever is fard and whatever is haram for a muslim it is the same throughout the world irrespective whether they living in a muslim or a non muslim society there are many muslims who give excuse that because i'm living in a western country or because i'm living in non muslim society some things are excused what is fard is fard what is haram is haram as far as the other aspects are concerned regarding mustahab things which are encouraged those which are considered as sunnah mustahab things which is encouraged it is the same also but there may be a little bit leniency for example covering the head for a muslim man or wearing a cap is mustahab it is the sunnah of the prophet but if you feel that are living in a non muslim society and you feel that wearing a cap may endanger your life and if you want to avoid that act you can do it because wearing a cap is not fard in islam if you do it you will get plus points if you don't do it you have no loss but you will not get the plus points so living in a non muslim society the thing which is mustahab if you fear regarding certain aspects and you avoid it you will not get the plus points similarly things which are makru things which are discouraged or the same throughout the world but they can be a little bit leniency for example going for the call of nature standing and doing the call of nature it is makru but if you know living in a western country and the toilets may not permit you and if you do it 
there is no problem, but you will lose the plus points. You don't gain negative points. So as far as the fard and the harams are concerned, there is no excuse at all. As far as the other aspects are concerned about the sunnah and the makru, if you want to avoid it for certain reason, you can do it. You will not get negative points, but you will lose the positive points. This was in short regarding the first category of a behavior of a Muslim in a non-Muslim society. As far as the second category is concerned, the role of a Muslim in a non-Muslim society, as far as relationships with a non-Muslim is concerned, as far as actions and deeds with a non-Muslim is concerned, it can be further divided into three subcategories. The first is general dealing with the non-Muslim. The second is special relationships with the non-Muslims. And the third is dawah with the non-Muslims. As far as the first subcategory is concerned regarding the general dealings of a Muslim with the non-Muslims, it is the same. You have to be honest with the non-Muslim. You have to be kind to him. You have to be just with him. You have to be merciful. As far as the general dealing is concerned, in day-to-day -day life, which does not directly concern harming your iman, then how you deal with a Muslim, you have to deal the same way with a non-Muslim in general day-to-day -day dealings. And there are many Muslims who say, ah, he's a non-Muslim. You know, so if I cheat him, it's not a problem. Islam does not give you permission to cheat anyone, whether they're Muslim or non-Muslim. Islam does not give you permission to deal unjustly, whether they're Muslim or with a non-Muslim. It's the same. And this can be derived from two verses of the glorious Quran, from Surah Mumtahina, chapter number 60, verse number 8 and 9. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah Mumtahina, chapter number 60, verse number 8, that Allah forbids you not, as far as those non-Muslims are concerned, who fight you not for your faith, nor drive you out of your homes from dealing with them with justice and kindness. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves those who are just and kind. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that as far as the non-Muslims are concerned, as long as they do not fight you for your faith, for your iman, or do not drive you out of your home, Allah forbids you not from dealing with them with justice and kindness. For Allah loves those who are just and kind. But the next verse of the Quran, Allah says, in Surah Mumtahina, chapter number 60, verse number 9, but Allah forbids you only as far as those non-Muslims are concerned who fight for your faith and drive you out of your homes or support those people who indulge in these activities. Allah forbids you from keeping friendship and asking for protection from these people. So if a non-Muslim fights you for your faith or drives you out of your home or supports those people who fight you for your faith or drive you out of the homes, Allah forbids you from going to them for friendship or for protection. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very clear that under normal circumstances, with a non-Muslim, you have to deal justly and kindly. Unless he fights for your faith or drives you out of your home. And there's a verse in the Quran, which many of the Muslims, they misunderstand. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 144, where Allah says, Ya ayyuhal lazina amanu, O you who believe, take not for awliya, the unbelievers, in preference to the believers. And many of the translations, they translate the Arabic word awliya as friends. So the translation reads that, O oh, you who believe, do not take for friends unbelievers 
in preference to believers, which I feel it's a wrong translation. The correct translation is the word awliya should be translated as someone who's a protector. So the right translation is that Ya ayyuha lazin amanu, O you who believe, do not take for protectors, unbelievers, in preference to believers. Do not take for protectors, non-Muslims, in preference to Muslims. And the same message is repeated in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 57 and 58. That, O you who believe, do not take for friends and protectors those who make a mockery of religion or take it as a sport. That means all those non-Muslims who take your deen as a mockery or as a sport, do not keep friendship with them, nor go to them for protection. These verses of the Quran are very clear. But otherwise, keeping acquaintanceship with a non-Muslim, keeping normal friendship with a non-Muslim is no problem at all. Under normal circumstances, we should treat the non-Muslims with justice and kindness. In fact, I say we should go a step further so that they're impressed with our religion, they're impressed with our deen. And you can find several examples in the life history of the Prophet Muhammad Several. You can give a talk only on giving examples how the Prophet dealt with the non-Muslims. And many of us are aware of that incident where a non-Muslim, he enters the mosque of the Prophet and he urinates. The Sahabas are irritated. They want to teach the non-Muslim a lesson, but the Prophet, he stops them. And he says, be calm. Get some water and wash the floor. That's it. We know of the famous incidents. Whenever Prophet Muhammad used to walk, there was a non-Muslim lady who used to throw dirt on the Prophet every day. Whenever he used to walk, the non-Muslim lady used to throw dirt. One day, when the Prophet walks below the house of that non-Muslim lady, no dirt falls on him. So he's surprised. He goes to a house to find out why was no dirt thrown today. And he realizes that she was sick and he prays for a shifa. And that non-Muslim lady, she's so impressed with the Prophet that she accepts Islam. We have the example in the seerah of the Prophet Muhammad that there was a Jew by the name of Zaid. The Prophet had borrowed some money from him. But before the time was due, that Jew, he comes to the Prophet and he demands for the money back. And he's rude. He speaks rudely to the Prophet that give my money back. And the time was not yet up. Hadat Umar he gets angry and he says, Oh enemy of God, had it not been for the treaty between the Muslims and the Jews, I would have chopped off your head for speaking to the Prophet like that. Hazrat Umar we know that he was a man of justice. He gets irritated. How could someone speak to the Prophet of Allah like that? The Prophet immediately intervenes and he tells Hazrat Umar that be calm. And he tells Hazrat Umar that give this Jew his money back and add to it the amount of 20 gallons because you frightened him. Because Hazrat Umar frightened him, the man did not have the right to ask the money because the time wasn't yet up. The time wasn't due. Yet because Hazrat Umar he frightened that non-Muslim, the Prophet said besides giving the money back to him, add 20 gallons worth because he had frightened the Jew. And Alhamdulillah, the Jew is impressed with the behavior of the Prophet and he accepts Islam. So generally, the Muslims should be kind and just to the non-Muslims. We have to be the right example so that they'll realize we are the followers of the religion of peace. A Muslim is a person who acquires peace by submitting his will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as far as general dealing is concerned, we have to be kind and just. But there is a caution which I always mention in my talk, whenever I'm dealing with this topic, that 
keeping non-Muslim friends is no problem as long as you are having an influence on that non-Muslim. If it's the vice versa, then there is a danger. If the non-Muslim friend is having a greater influence on you, then there is a problem. Because whenever there is a relationship between two human beings, and when you keep on meeting very often, no one can tell me that nothing happens. Either you're influencing him or he's influencing you. You can't say that nothing is happening. So if you're having influence on him, Alhamdulillah, Summa Alhamdulillah, continue the relationship so that he understands the deen al haq the religion of Islam better. But if he's having influence on you, then be careful. You may follow his path, which may be wrong. So here, if it's a relationship in which your deen is in danger, then I feel you have to discontinue that relationship. You have to be careful. The Quran is very clear. As far as protection is concerned, if there are two options, believer and unbeliever, a believer is preferable at all times. The verse says, do not take unbelievers for protectors in preference to believers. So as far as your deen is not in danger, and if you are having an influence on the non-Muslim, Alhamdulillah. And I, by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I have hundreds of non-Muslim friends. MashaAllah, hundreds, Hindus, Christians, many. And almost all that I know, they respect me, MashaAllah. They know that I'm a Dai, I speak about the religion. Yet, Alhamdulillah, they respect me. So as long as you are having influence on them, it's very good. In terms of special relationship where your deen is in danger, I'd like to give an example. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 221, that the believing man, a Muslim, should not marry a mushrika, an idolatrous, an unbelieving woman, unless she believes. A believing woman who is a slave woman is better than an unbelieving woman even if she allows you. That means a Muslim man cannot marry a non-Muslim woman, a woman who does idol worship, who does shirk, unless she believes, unless she becomes a Muslim, unless she becomes a woman. Because a Muslima, a Momina, a believing woman is far better than an unbelieving woman even if she allows you. Means in preference to marry a Muslim woman even if she may be a slave woman, she may be a bond woman, she may be a very poor woman, she may be an ugly woman. If she has faith, she is far superior than an unbelieving woman even if she allows you. She may be the most beautiful woman in the world. She may be the richest woman in the world. Yet, a Muslim, a believing woman who is poor and ugly is far superior than an unbelieving woman. And the same goes vice versa, that a believing woman should not marry an unbelieving man, a mushrik man, until he believes. A believing man, even if he's a slave man, he's far superior to a man who does shirk. Even he may allow you. He may be the most handsome man in the world. He may be the richest man in the world. He may be the king of the country. But a believing man, even if he's poor, even if he's ugly, he's far better in marriage than a mushrik man. So here, because the relationship is concerned, that if you marry a non-Muslim, if you marry a mushrika or a mushrik, your deen is in danger. That's the reason it is prohibited for a Muslim to marry a non-Muslim, marry a mushrik. Otherwise, under normal circumstances, in general dealing, you have to be kind to the non-Muslim. We come to the third subcategory of the role of a Muslim, a non-Muslim society, that is dealing with the non-Muslims. And that third subcategory is dawah. What is the meaning of the Arabic word dawah? Those who come from the Indian subcontinent, they know the meaning of the word dawat. The moment you hear the word dawat, you start thinking of a biryani or a pulao. 
Dava ya Dawat does not mean biryani or pulao. Dawa means to call, to invite. And an invitation can only be given to an outsider. So Dawa specifically means inviting a non-Muslim towards Islam. When you speak about Islam to a Muslim, the more appropriate word is Islah, which means to repair, which means to improve. But when we speak about Islam to a non-Muslim, inviting him towards Islam, the more appropriate word is Dawa. Though this word Dawa is used synonymously both while speaking to Muslim as well as non-Muslim, but specifically Dawa means inviting the non-Muslims towards Islam. And this Dawa is a fard on every Muslim, especially those Muslims who are living in a non-Muslim society. I started my talk by quoting a verse from the glorious Quran from Surah Al-Imran, chapter number three, verse number 110, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kuntum khaira ummatan ukhrijat linnas. O ye Muslims, ye are the best of people evolved for mankind. Allah is giving us an honor and calling us khaira ummah, the best of people. Whenever there is honor, it is always followed up with a the responsibility. There is no honor without responsibility. For example, in a school, the principal has got more honor than a teacher. A teacher has got more honor than a clerk. But simultaneously, the principal has got more responsibility than a teacher. A teacher has got more responsibility than a clerk. There is no honor without responsibility. Allah is giving us an honor in the Quran as calling us the Khaira Ummah. Ye Muslims, ye are the best of peoples evolved for mankind. Don't you think we have a responsibility? The reply is given in the same verse. Allah continues and says, Ta'muruna bil ma'rufi wa tanhauna anil munkar wa tu'minuna billah. Because we enjoin what is good and we forbid what is wrong and we believe in Allah. If we do not enjoin what is good and if we do not forbid what is wrong, we aren't fit to be called as Khaira Ummah. We aren't fit to be called as Muslims. It is compulsory for every Muslim that he invites the non-Muslims. He invites them towards the good and forbids them from doing wrong and believe in Allah. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Muhammad, chapter number 47, verse number 38, that if you do not do your job, if you do not for the responsibility Allah has given you. Allah says, Wa in Yastabdil common gairakum. Allah will substitute in your place another people. Summa lakinam salakum. And they will not be like you. If you do not do your job, if you do not follow the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will substitute in your place another people and they will not be like you. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 143 that we have made you an ummat a middlemost community, so that you may be a witness over the nations, as the Prophet will be a witness over you. It is the duty of every Muslim to convey the message of Islam to the non-Muslims. I'd like to ask you a question. Suppose you go away from your home, from your house for work, and your neighbor he abuses your mother. He uses foul language against your mother. When you come back home, and when you come to know that your neighbor has used foul language against your mother, what will you do? What will you do? When you get back home, and you come to know that your neighbor has used foul language against your mother for no reason at all. And when you get back home, and when you come to know about this, what will you do? What will you do? What will you do? Beat him up. What will you do? Bash him. What will you do? Kill him. One brother is saying, beat him up. Other brother is saying, bash him. Third person is saying, kill him. When you get back home and you come to know that your neighbor has abused, used foul language against your mother for no rhyme or reason, 
someone wants to beat him up, someone wants to bash him, someone wants to kill him. But you see to it that your neighbor is taught a lesson. Will you or not? Yes or no? Of course, if you cannot do it yourself, you will hire someone else to do the job. Yes or no? Of course, because we love our mother. We respect our mother. Fine? We'll see to it that we will teach that neighbor a lesson. I want to ask you a question. That's in this world, who do you love the most? Number one. Who do you love the most? Allah. We love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more than our mother, more than our father, more than our wife, more than our children. We love him number one. You ask any Muslim and the reply would be the same. That the person you love the most is Allah. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Maryam, chapter number 19, verse number 88 to 92, Allah says, وَقَالُوا تَقَدُ الرَّحْمَانُ وَلَدَى That they say, the non-Muslims, the Jews and the Christians, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has begotten a son. لَقَدْ جِيتُمْ شَيَّنْ إِدَّى Indeed, they have put forth a thing which is most monstrous. تَقَادُ السَّمَوَاتُ يَتَفَتَّنَّا مِنُّ As though the skies are ready to burst. وَطَنْ شَقُ الْأَرْزُ The earth to split asunder. وَتَخِرُ الْجِبَالُ حَدَّى And the mountains to fall down to utter ruin. Allah says in the Quran, if anyone says that Allah has begotten a son, if the sky had feelings, the sky would have burst open. If the earth had feelings, the earth would have split open. The mountains would have fallen down to utter ruin. If anyone says that Allah has begotten a son, because anyone who says that Allah has begotten a son, it is one of the most heinous things you can say about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We see today, especially in the non-Muslim society, every day, our non-Muslim friends, our non-Muslim colleagues, they are abusing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are saying Allah has begotten a son and we can't even open our mouth. When we ask a Muslim, who do you love the most? The reply is Allah. When someone wants to abuse our mother, use foul language against our mother, you want to beat him up. You want to bash him. You want to kill him. And every day people are abusing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you can't even open your mouth. I'm not telling that you go and bash him. I'm not telling go and beat him. I'm not saying go and kill him. It's not allowed in Islam. You can't kill a non-Muslim because he's abusing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not allowed just for that. At least open your mouth. When someone is abusing your mother, you want to beat him, you want to bash him. Every day, our non-Muslim friends, our non-Muslim colleagues, they are abusing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we can't even open our mouth. Leave aside opening our mouth, we go and become party to them. Very soon, after a couple of weeks, it's going to be Christmas season. And many of us Muslims, we wish our Christian friends Merry Christmas. Leave us at correcting them, you are becoming party to them. You know, the Christians, they celebrate Christmas and they say that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is the son of God. And God begot Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, Billah, on 25th of December. Leave us at correcting them, you are congratulating them, you are giving shahada that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, knows Billah, has begotten a son on the 25th of December. Leave us at correcting them, you are giving shahada. Merry Christmas means what? You're congratulating him and giving witness that knows Billah, Allah has begotten a son on the 25th of December. We have to open a mouth. I'm not saying go and beat them or bash them. At least open a mouth. Can't you open a mouth? Non-Muslim society, whether it's a Christian society or a Hindu society, same thing there. The festival, which is very common from where I come, that is Ganesh Chaturthi, Ganpati. And many Muslims go to this festival. And when they offer the prasad, the food which is put in front of the idol, the Muslims know it is haram, but how can they offend their friend? He'll feel bad. So what they do? They say, Bismillah and have it. So tomorrow they'll say bismillah and have pork, 
day after tomorrow they said bismillah and have alcohol what's happened to the muslim ummah we can't even open our mouth who are we afraid of it is so easy believe me to talk is so easy only thing you have to open your mouth you don't have to insult him you don't have to abuse him quran clearly says in surah anam chapter number 6 verse number 108 revile not those abuse not those gods worship besides allah lest in the ignorance they will abuse allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they will revile allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so you do not have to use foul language against them only thing you have to ask them simple questions it's so easy but we muslims we are afraid to open our mouth we are afraid to dawa because if i open my mouth i will lose his friendship we are more interested in keeping friends with a non muslim than the friendship with allah subhanahu wa taala and believe me if you really speak about haq they will respect you the experience that i have in my life being in a medical college i never had problems in fact when i studied in bombay the percentage of muslim was very few 5 6% when asked to speak with the non muslims all my muslim friends run away ye to pitwayenge now he is going to give us a bashing so they run away but i never had a problem no non muslim has yet caught my collar alhamdulillah when you speak the truth they respect you and when i was in medical college it's compulsory we have to pass in viva vos in viva and 50% of our marks and all the subjects for viva and as to dawa even with my professors many people said that if you do too much of dawa they will fail you so i said no problem allah if he wants that i should do dawa one more year with them no problem <laughs> but alhamdulillah what should you be afraid of we should open our mouth but unfortunately we muslims we are afraid we are more interested in keeping the friendship of our non muslim friends rather than friendship of allah subhanahu wa taala allah says in the quran in surah baqara chapter number 2 verse number 120 walan tarda ankal yahudu walan nasara hatta tatabiyu millatihum the jews and the christians they will never be satisfied until you follow their brand of religion until you follow their way of life allah says in the quran in surah baqara chapter number 2 verse number 111 وقالوا لا يدخل الجنة إلا من كان هودا أو نصارى. They say the Jews and Christians, you Muslims, you shall never enter Jannah unless you become a Jew or a Christian. With all your piety, with all your salah, with the mark on your forehead, with the fasting you do in the month of Ramadan, with the Hajj you have performed, you shall never enter Jannah unless you become a Jew or a Christian. Allah says, Til kamani yuhum. This is the wishful thinking. Bakwas e bakwas. Kul, tell them. Ha, tu bana nakum. Produce your proof. In kundum sadikin, but if you're truthful, Allah says, if anyone makes tall claims, tell them. Ha, tu bana nakum. Produce your proof. In kundum sadikin, but if you're truthful. And the Christians, they have produced the Bible in no less than two thousand different languages. They say, my Bible says this. My Bible says that. My Bible says this. My Bible says that. What do we have to do? Do we have to follow the Bible hook, line, and sinker? When anyone shows you his identity card, what do you do? You verify whether that card is correct or not. So when they are telling you the Bible is the word of God, what do we have to do? We have to analyze the scriptures. How many of us Muslims are analyzing the scriptures? How many of us? Leave aside we. doing dawa to them with their scriptures these christian missionaries they are using our quran our quran against us the christian missionaries they come knocking at our door and they ask us a question they come knocking at the doors of the muslims and they ask us a question that isn't it mentioned in the quran that bible is the word of god and most of us will say yes then the next question is then why don't you follow the bible and we have got no reply that is the next question that how many times is the name of your last and final messenger prophet muhammad peace be upon him mentioned in the quran if you know you will say five times four times as muhammad and one says ahmad sallallahu alaihi wasallam how many times is the name of jesus christ peace be upon him mentioned in the quran if you don't know they will tell you 
Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, by name, is mentioned 25 times in the Quran. They ask the next question. Who's greater? A person who's mentioned five times by name in the Quran is greater, or a person who's mentioned 25 times by name in the Quran is greater? They ask the question, but they will not give you the reply. They let your mind think. They ask the next question. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did he have a father and mother? We say yes. He had a father and mother. Did Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, did he have a father and mother? We have to agree. That as for the teachings of the Quran, Isa alayhi salam, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, had a mother, but he had no father. That's the next question. Who's greater? A person who has a father is greater or a person who does not have a father is greater? A person who's born by the help of the father is greater or a person who's born without a father is greater? Who's greater? A person who has a father is greater or a person who does not have a father is greater? Who's greater? Who's greater? They ask the question, but they don't give you the reply. They let your mind think. They are using us Muslims as punching bags, as doormats. They are making nest in our head and we can't even open our mouth. It's a shame. They ask the next question. That... Did your Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do any miracles? We say yes, he did several miracles. Do you know of any miracle in which he gave life to the dead? And we have to agree that nowhere does the Quran or any hadith say that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave life to the dead. That's the next question. Did Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, did he give life to the dead? And we have to agree the Quran says, Bismillah, wake up in the name of Allah. Yes, he gave life to the dead. So who's greater? A person who can give life to the dead is greater or a person who cannot give life to the dead is greater. Who's greater? A person who can give life to the dead is greater or a person who cannot give life to the dead is greater? Who's greater? Who's greater? Who? The question is who's greater? When you say who's greater in English, it has to be one of the two. Unless your English is weak. They ask the question, but they don't give you the reply. They let your mind think. They ask the next question, that your Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is he physically dead or alive? And we have to agree, physically Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam dead, he's buried in Medina. Is Isa alayhi salam, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is he physically dead or alive? We have to agree that he's alive. The Quran says in Surah Nisa, Chapter 4, verse 158, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has raised him up alive. So who's greater? A prophet who's dead is greater or a prophet who's alive is greater? They ask the question, but they don't give you the reply. They let your mind think. They use as Muslims as punching bags, as dough mats, and we can't even open our mouth. See, doing dawa is very easy. If you read the Quran with understanding, and if you keep your mind open, doing da'wah is very easy. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 64, Kul, ya hilal kitab, say, O people of the book, ta'alo ila qalmitin sawa imbarina baynakum, come to common terms, ask us and you. Which is the first term? Allah, na'buda illallah. That we worship none but Allah. Wala nushrika bihi shayyam, that we associate no partners with him. That we erect not among ourselves lords and patrons other than Allah. If then they turn back. Fakulu shadu, say be witness. Bianna Muslimun, that we are Muslims bowing away to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This verse of the glorious Quran, Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 64, according to me, is the master key as far as dawah to non Muslim is concerned. Is the master key for dawah. It says, Come to common terms, ask me, us and you. Which is the first term? Allah, na'buda illallah. That we worship none but Allah. That we associate no partners with him. And if you see the tapes and the lectures that I've given, all these questions have been answered. How to dawah has been explained. It's so easy, the only thing you have to do is open your mouth. 
The non-Muslim society can be divided into further three categories. One is the category who is religious. There are in the non-Muslim society. In the Western society, there are, since majority are Christians, there is a small percentage who are religious. They are Christians and they follow the scripture, the Bible. In other societies like in India, where majority are Hindus, there is a small portion, a small percentage of Hindus who are religious, who follow the scriptures. The best way to dawah with these people is Ta'ala wila kalmitin sawa im baina bainakum. Come to common terms as we us and you. Which is the first term? Allah nabda illallah. That we worship none but Allah. We have to speak from their scriptures trying to prove about one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The best thing about Dawa, the most important aspect is proving about oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All the other aspects are secondary. If you cannot convince a non-Muslim about Tawheed, about monotheism, it is useless. You may speak to him about other aspects of Islam, but if he yet continues doing shirk, it will never be forgiven. Shirk is the biggest sin in Islam, which Allah will never forgive, unless he repents before death. And this way how to do dawah, based on the verse of the Quran, I have dealt in various of my talks, similarities between Islam and Christianity, similarities between Islam and Hinduism, and how to do dawah. For example, living in the Western country, where the majority claim to be Christians, though a small percentage are religious. In bridging the gaps with the Christians, I've given a talk on similarities between Islam and Christianity. Where I've mentioned there that Islam is the only non-Christian faith which makes it an article of faith to believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. We believe that he was one of the mightiest messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We believe that he was the Messiah, translated Christ. We believe that he was born miraculously without any male intervention, which many modern day Christians today do not believe. We believe that he gave life to the dead with God's permission. We believe that he healed those born blind and lepers with God's permission. The Christians and the Muslims, we are going together. But one may ask, then where is the parting of ways? The parting of ways is, there are many Christians who say that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he claimed divinity. He said that he was Almighty God. In fact, if you read the Bible, there is not a single unequivocal statement. In the complete Bible, there is not a single unambiguous statement. In the complete Bible, where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself says that I am God, or where he says, worship me. I am a student of Islam and compiled religion, and I read the Bible. There is not a single unequivocal statement, not a single unambiguous statement. In the complete Bible, where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself says that I am God, or where he says, worship me. In fact, if you read the Bible, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself said, it's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 28, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself said that my father is greater than I. Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 29, my father is greater than all. Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 28, I cast out devils with the Spirit of God. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 11, verse number 20, I with the finger of God cast out devils. Gospel of John, chapter number 5, verse number 30, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, for I seek not my will, but the will of my Father. Anyone who says I seek not my will, but the will of Almighty God, he's a Muslim. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is a Muslim. And it's clearly mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter number 2, verse number 22, that ye men of Israel, listen to this, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God amongst you by wonders and miracles, which God did by him, and you are witness to it. A man approved of God amongst you by wonders and signs and miracles, which God did by him, and you are witness to it. So if we read the scriptures, we can prove from their scripture that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he never claimed divinity. He was the messenger of Almighty God. We can prove from the Bible 
about the coming, about the advent, about the prophecy of the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You can give a talk on that. It's mentioned in the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 18, verse number 18. In the book of Isaiah, chapter number 29, verse number 12. In the Song of Solomon, chapter number 5, verse number 16. In the New Testament, in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 16. In the Gospel of John, chapter number 15, verse number 26. In the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 7. In the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 12 to 14. You can only go on giving references from the Bible where the prophecy of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is mentioned. Time doesn't permit us to talk about these aspects. You can refer to my video cassette on similarities between Islam and Christianity or Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Bible. Similarly, if you're living in a non-Muslim society where you have Hindus, you can come to common terms as far as their scripture is concerned and our scripture is concerned. If you're living with Buddhists, it's the same. If you're living with Jews, it's the same technique. So this is as far as one category of non-Muslim is concerned, those who are religious. In today's world, especially the Western world, though people claim to be Christians, very few are actually practicing Christians. They are more impressed with science and technology, and most of them Practically, they are atheists. They do not believe in God. So how will you do dawah to them? If I meet an atheist, and if he tells me that there is no God, the first thing I'll do is, I will congratulate him. You will wonder, why is Zakir congratulating an atheist? The reason I will congratulate an atheist is because most of the non-Muslims they are non-Muslims because of the parents. Most of the human beings, they follow their parents blindly. He's a Christian because father is a Christian. He's a Hindu because father is a Hindu. Many Muslims are Muslims because their fathers are Muslim. This atheist is thinking. His parents may be religious, but he's thinking. He does not agree in the gods which the parents worship. So he says there's no God. And the reason I congratulate the atheist is because he has said the first part of the Islamic Shahada, La ilaha, there is no God. So half my job is done. <laughs> the only thing I have to do is illallah, which I shall do, inshallah. See, the atheist, as I told you, Sulaiman Al Imran chapter 3, verse 64, is the master key for dawah. Ta'ala wila kalmitin sawa im bayna baynakum. Come to common terms, I have been us and you. There are many Muslims who ask me that what is the commonality between the atheist and the Muslim? I said the first part of the Islamic Shahada, La ilaha, there is no God. Because half my job is done. To another non-Muslim who believes in a God, first I have to prove to him that the God is worshipping is wrong. And then I have to talk to him about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here, half my job is done. He has already said La ilaha, there is no God. Only thing I have to do is illallah which I shall do, inshallah. Now, most of these atheists, as I told you, they have become atheists because they believe in science and technology, which they feel is so advanced, and they become atheists. And after congratulating him, I ask him a question. That, suppose there is an equipment, there's an object, which no one in the world has ever seen, no human being has seen, if it is bought in front of you, and if the question is asked, that who will be the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of this equipment, of this object? If I ask this question to an atheist, that an object or an equipment which no human being has ever seen in this world, if it's bought in front of that atheist, and if he's asked the question, that who will be the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of this equipment, what reply can he give you? What reply can he give you? Creator, manufacturer, some may say creator, some may say manufacturer, some may say producer, some will say inventor. Whatever they say, it will be somewhat similar. Just keep it at the back of the mind. Either the atheist will tell you a creator, a manufacturer, a producer, an inventor, it will be somewhat similar, or maker. Keep it at the back of the mind and continue. Ask him the next question. That how did 
this universe come into existence? So the atheist will tell you that we have come to know that initially our whole universe was one primary nebula. Later on, there was a secondary separation, a big bang, which gave rise to galaxies, the stars, the planets, the sun, and the earth on which we live. This they call as the big bang. If you ask the question to the atheist, when did you come to know about this big bang? He will tell you, 30 years back, 40 years back, we came to know how the universe came into existence in the Big Bang. You ask him the question. What you're talking about the Big Bang is already mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30. Do not the kafiru. Do not the unbelievers see. Anna samawati wal arda. The heavens and the earth were joined together and we clove them asunder. What you're talking about the Big Bang is already mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran 1400 years ago? The atheist may say, maybe it's a fluke. Don't argue. You have to ask me the next question. That what is the shape of this earth on which we live? So he will tell you that previously, the human beings, they believe that the earth was flat. It was in 1577, it's a Francis Drake, he sailed around the earth that he proved that the earth was spherical. You ask him the question, the Quran mentions the spherical shape of the earth 1400 years ago in Surah Naziyat, chapter number 79, verse number 30, where Allah says, Wal ard And thereafter, we have made the earth egg shape. The earth we live in is not completely round like a ball. It is geospherical in shape. It is flattened from the poles. And the egg, that is referred in the Quran, Dahaha. One of its meanings is an expanse. One of the meanings is an egg. It specifically refers to the egg of an ostrich. And if you analyze the shape of the egg of an ostrich, that too is geospherical in shape. Imagine, the Quran speaks about the geospherical shape of the earth 1400 years ago. You ask the question to the atheist, that who could have mentioned this in the Quran? We will tell you, oh, maybe your prophet Muhammad was an intelligent man. Don't argue, continue. You ask him the next question, that the light of the moon, is it its own light or reflected light? So he will tell you, previously we thought that the light of the moon was its own light. Recently we have come to know that the light of the moon is not its own light, but it is a reflected light of the sun. Yesterday in science means 40 years back, 50 years back, 100 years back. Quran mentions 1400 years ago in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 61, that blessed is he, who has made the constellations in the skies and placed therein sun having a light of its own and moon having borrowed light, having reflected light. Who could have mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago that the light of the moon was not its own light but it was a reflected light, but it was a borrowed light? Again, the atheist may say, maybe your prophet Muhammad was a very intelligent person. Don't argue with him. Continue. When I was in school, I passed my school in 1982. I had learned that the sun was stationary. It did not rotate about its own axis. Is that what is mentioned in the Quran? I said, no, this is what I learned in school. I learned in school that the sun was stationary. It did not rotate about its own axis. But the Quran mentions in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 33, It is Allah who has created the day and the night. Washamsa wal kamar, the sun and the moon. Kulun fi falaki yas bahun, each one traveling in an orbit with its own motion. The Arabic word yas bahun describes the motion of a moving body, and it says that the sun, besides revolving, it even rotates about its own axis. And today science tells us, with the help of an equipment, we can have the image of the sun on the tabletop. And the sun has got black spots and it takes approximately 25 days for these black spots to complete one rotation, indicating that the sun takes 25 days to complete one rotation. Who could have mentioned this? What I learned in school 23 years back, now the science says it is wrong. And the Quran has mentioned this 1400 years ago. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran? The atheist may give a long pause. Don't wait for the reply. You can keep on continuing. Today, scientists tell us that our universe is expanding. The same message is given in the Quran 1400 years ago. 
in Surah Dhariyat, chapter number 51, verse number 47, that we have created the vastness of space, the expanding universe. In the field of hydrology, it was Sir Bernard Palissy in 1580 who was the first person who described the present water cycle which we learn in school. Previously, we did not know about the water cycle. The first person was Sir Bernard Palissy in 1580 that he described that the water evaporates from the ocean, forms into clouds, it moves into the interior, it falls down as rain, and the water table is replenished. Now, this water cycle is described in the Quran in great detail in several places. In Surah Zumur chapter 39, verse 21, in Surah Rum chapter number 30, verse number 24, in Surah Mu'minun chapter number 23, verse number 18, in Surah Hijar chapter number 15, verse 22, in Surah Nur chapter number 24, verse 43, in Surah Rum chapter number 30, verse 48, in Surah Ra chapter number 13, verse number 17, in Surah Araf chapter number 7, verse number 57, in Surah Furqan chapter number 25, verse 48 to 49, in Surah Fatir chapter 35, verse number 9, in Surah Qaf chapter number 50, verse number 9, in 11, in Surah Waqiyah chapter 56, verse 68 to 70, in Surah Mulk chapter 67, verse number 30, in Surah Tariq chapter number 86, verse number 11. You can keep on giving references only of water cycle mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago. The Quran speaks about the water cycle in great detail. You can talk for several minutes on each verse talking about water cycle. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran 14 years ago? And the atheists would be silent. Keep on. There are several scientific facts mentioned in the Quran. The Quran speaks about geology. Today science tells us that the mountains give stability to the earth. If the mountains were not there, the earth would shake. The Quran says in Surah Naba, chapter number 78, verse number 6 and 7, that we have created the earth as an expanse, while Jabala Autada, and the mountains at stakes. Today, science tells us that the portion of the mountain we see above the ground is a very small portion. The major portion is deep within the ground. Like how when you put a tent peg in the ground, a small portion remains on top, the major portion goes down. And these roots of the mountain, they give stability to the earth. The Quran says in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 31, that we have created the mountain standing firm on the earth lest it would shake with you. In the field of oceanology, we knew previously that there were two types of water, salt and sweet. But we did not know that why these two water did not mix. Quran says in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 53, that it is Allah who has created two bodies of flowing water, one sweet and the other salty. Though they meet, they do not mix. There is a barrier between them which is forbidden to be trespassed. Today, after science advance, we have come to know that though one type of water flows into the other type of water, it loses its constituents and gets homogenized into the water it flows. This homogenizing area, the Quran refers to as barzakh, an unseen barrier, which science has discovered today. And Quran has mentioned 1400 years ago. In the field of biology, the Quran says in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30, وَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ كُلَّا شَيْنْ هَيْ We have created every living thing from water. Who could have believed 1400 years ago that every living creature is made of water? Today, science has confirmed that everything is made from water. Quran says in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 45, we have created every animal from water. Quran says in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 54, we have created every human being from water. In the field of botany, Quran says that even the plants have got sexes, male and female. In Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse 53, which we came to know recently. Quran says that every kind of fruits are created in pairs. In Surah Rath, chapter number 13, verse number 3. In the field of zoology, Quran speaks about the lifestyle of the animals. In Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 38. Quran speaks about the lifestyle of the bees. In Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse 68 and 69. Quran speaks about the spider. In Surah Ankabut, chapter 29, verse 41. About the ant in Surah Namal, chapter number 27, verse number 7 to 18. And all these aspects of the spider, of the ants, of the bees, we have come to know recently, and Quran mentions in detail 1400 years ago. Who could have mentioned this? Quran speaks about medicine, that in the honey there is healing for humankind. In Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 68 to 69. Quran speaks about the production of milk and the circulation of blood. In Surah Nahal, 
chapter 16, verse 66, and Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse 21, 1400 years ago, which we have come to know recently. Quran speaks about medicine, about physiology, about embryology. The various stages of the human development is described in detail in Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 12 to 14. Quran speaks about genetics, about the sex responsible for the child in Surah Najm, chapter number 53, verse number 45. Quran speaks about the fingerprinting method in Surah Qiyamah, chapter number 75, verse number 3 and 4. After every scientific fact mentioned in the Quran, ask the atheist who could have mentioned this in the Quran 1400 years ago. And his reply would be the creator, the manufacturer, the maker, the inventor. This creator, this manufacturer, this maker, this inventor, we Muslims, we call him as Allah. Even to an atheist, we can prove about the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the help of the last and final revelation of the glorious Quran. We are not using science to prove Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The science is the yardstick of the atheist. Our yardstick is the Quran. We are using our yardstick and comparing with his yardstick and trying to prove that our yardstick, the glorious Quran, is far superior to your science. So these type of non-Muslims do dawa based on the similarities. If he thinks science is ultimate, we use science and try and get science and the commonalities in the Quran and try to get him closer to Islam. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 125, Invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. We have to dawah with hikmah and with husna. Today, the times have changed. Especially after 9-11, we find that the Muslims are on the receiving end. There is virulent propaganda about Islam on the international media whether it be the international newspapers, the international magazines, the radio broadcast stations, the television channels, there is virulent propaganda about Islam. They are bombarding people with misinformation about Islam. It's the duty of every Muslim that he tries to remove these misconceptions. There are various styles of doing dawah. The most commonly used is that you speak a thousand good things about Islam to a non-Muslim. Even if you speak a thousand good points about Islam to a non-Muslim, and even if he agrees with those thousand points, yet, at the back of his mind, he'll think, ah, you are the same Muslim who's a terrorist. Ah, you are a fundamentalist. Ah, you are the same Muslim who marry more than one woman. Ah, you are the Muslims who subjugate the woman by keeping her behind the veil. These few negative points at the back of the mind will prevent the non-Muslim from accepting the beauty of Islam. What I personally prefer, that whenever I meet a non-Muslim, I ask him up front, what do you feel is wrong with Islam? With your limited knowledge, whether right or wrong, what do you feel is wrong with Islam? And I make him comfortable. You can ask any question on Islam, you can criticize Islam, you can attack Islam. I will try my level best to reply. And in the experience that I have of more than a decade in the field of Dawah, I have come to know that there are about 20 common questions which the non-Muslims have regarding Islam. And when they ask you three or four questions, invariably it falls amongst these 20 common questions. So if you know the reply to these 20 common questions asked by the non-Muslims, based on Quran, Hadith and their scripture, with reason, logic and science, even if you cannot convert him, at least you can neutralize him. You can remove the animosity which is there in his heart. I've written a book called The Replies to the Questions Asked by the Non-Muslims. And these questions arise depending upon how the media portrays Islam. And today, the number one question is regarding the Islamic word jihad. It was number five on the list previously. After 9-11, it became top of the charts. The others have come behind, but it's yet there. Time will not permit me to reply to all these. Inshallah, in tomorrow's talk, I will deal more with this topic about terrorists, about fundamentalists, about extremists, etc. in detail. I'll just tell you how to reply to the top of the charts. That is jihad. As far as this word jihad is concerned, 
there is not only a misconception among the non-Muslims, there is even a misconception among the Muslims. Most of the people think that any war fought by any Muslim for any reason, whether it be personal gain, whether it be for power, whether it be for money, it is called as jihad. Jihad does not mean any war fought by any Muslim for any reason, whether it be for his personal gain, for personal money, for power. Jihad comes from the Arabic word jihada, which means to strive, which means to struggle. In Islamic context, it means to strive and struggle against one's own evil inclination. Jihad also means to strive and struggle to make the society better. Jihad also means to strive and struggle in the battlefield in self-defense. Jihad also means to strive and struggle against oppression. So jihad basically means to strive and struggle. Many non-Muslims, mainly the Orientalists, they translate the Arabic word jihad as holy war. And unfortunately, many so-called Muslim scholars in inverted commas, even they translate jihad as holy war. In Arabic, if you translate holy war into Arabic, it would be Harbu Muqaddasa. And if you read the Quran, nowhere is the word Harbu Muqaddasa mentioned in the Quran, neither it is mentioned in the Hadith. So jihad does not mean holy war. Holy war was first used to describe the Crusades with the Christians. They killed tens and thousands of human beings in the name of religion. That holy war was used to describe the Crusades. Unfortunately, today it is used to describe jihad, which is totally a mistranslation. Jihad basically means to strive and means to struggle. One type of jihad can be kital, that is fighting, which is kital fi sabillillah, fighting in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But that too has got various rules and regulations, which you can refer to my video cassette, Jihad and Terrorism and Islamic Perspective, which I've dealt in detail about this. And I'll just give an example how to do dawah. Last year I had gone to States, last year, year before last, I had gone to states in Los Angeles and traveling, alhamdulillah, mashallah, different parts of the world in various countries, including the Western countries several times, USA, Canada, Australia, and other parts. I was prepared the way I'm dressed up with a cap, with a beard, with a coat. I was sure that in the US customs, I'll be asked for interrogation. So as I went to the immigration, they asked me the question that, why have you come here? So I said that I've come to receive an award. They asked me, what award? I said, award in service of humanity. I said, what do you do? I said, I spread truth. Jesus Christ, peace be upon I said, speak the truth and truth shall free you. And after asking many questions, I see to it that I pick up every opportunity to dawah. While going to the customs, I purposely mentioned that I've come for a convention, like I came this time, and I've come to receive an award. So they asked me, okay, go and open your bag. When they opened my bag, they saw a tape of mine, a videotape, that time videotape I taken. Jihad and terrorism. <laughs> so the custom officer, he asked me, that do you believe in jihad? I said, yes, I believe in jihad. Jihad means to strive and struggle. Jesus Christ, peace be upon, believe in jihad. He said, no, no, I'm talking about do you believe in fighting? I said, yes, even Jesus Christ, peace be upon, believed in fighting. If you read the Bible, in the Old Testament, Book of Exodus, chapter number 22, he speaks about fighting. Book of Exodus, chapter number 32, speaks about fighting. Book of Numbers, chapter number 31, speaks about fighting. Jesus Christ, peace be upon, mentioned in the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 22. He said that, take the sword and go and fight. So they said, but that was fighting against the evil. I said, yes, that's what the Quran says too. We have to fight against the evil. And in this way, when I started doing dawah, the custom officers all gathered together and there was a small mini lecture. I only told my host that, don't worry, I'm just doing dawah in the immigration and the customs. And sir, can we ask you one more question? Sir, can we ask you one more question? And to cut the story short, you should grab every opportunity and you should try and turn the tables over. Give the answer which he expects the least. But I don't want everyone to do that, otherwise they may get into problems. As far as dealing on the higher level where to turn the tables over, you have to be careful, otherwise you get into a problem. Then you say, okay, Dr. Zakin, I told me that. Depending upon the situation, you can prove from the Bible that what they attack about the Quran. The same thing is mentioned in the Bible. When I'm in India, I use a different strategy. The master key is the same, but I speak about Bhagavad Gita. I speak about Mahabharata. When the Hindus say that 
the Quran is wrong. It speaks about fighting. I tell them that there are more verses of fighting in Mahabharata than the Quran. But then they tell me, no, but this is a war between truth and falsehood. I said, same as what the Quran says. It is a war between the truth and falsehood. Then the Hindus tell me we have got no problem with the Quran. And if you read Bhagavad Gita, which is the most popular scripture of the Hindus, in chapter number one, verse number 43 to 46, Arjun, there's a fight between the cousins, the Pandavas and the Kauravas. Pandavas are five brothers, Kauravas are total 100 brothers. So Arjun, one of the Pandavas, in the battlefield, he puts his weapons on the battlefield, on the ground. And he says to Sri Krishna, who is God of the Hindus, he tells to Sri Krishna, I would prefer being killed unarmed rather than to fight against my cousin. Immediately next few verse, chapter number two, verse number two and three, Sri Krishna, who's supposed to be the God, he tells Arjun, how could such impurities come in your heart? How could you be so important? He calls him important. And further, Bhagavad Gita chapter two, verse number 31 onwards, he says, it is the duty of the Kshatriya to fight. If you don't fight, you will not go to the heavenly planet. It will take you away from the heavenly planet. And blessed are those Kshatriyas who get an opportunity to fight. And most of the critics of Islam, they point out a common hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam of Sahih Bukhari, volume number four, in the book of Jihad, hadith number 46, where Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that if a Mujahid goes to the battlefield. If he's killed, he will get Jannah, he'll go to heaven. If he comes back alive, he will get the booty of this world, he'll get the wealth of this world. And many critics, whether Christian, Hindus, they point this hadith and say, what kind of religion is this? He's talking about jihad, fighting, and you go to heaven, what kind of religion is this? I tell the Hindus that if you read Bhagavad Gita, chapter number two, verse number 37, Sri Krishna tells Arjun, that, oh Arjun, rise and fight. If you are killed, you will go to Swarg, heavenly planets. If you come back alive, you would get the wealth of this world. It is the verbatim translation of Sai Bukhari, volume 4, Hadith number 46. So when these critics of Islam, especially the Hindus, like Arun Shuri, I wonder that they haven't read their own scriptures and they're pointing all in the Quran. The moment you give the context and speak to them, the complete misconception is washed away. Come to common terms as we ascend you. So it's the duty of every Muslim that he conveys the message of Islam to the non-Muslims. Dawa is fard. But unfortunately today, we Muslims, we give excuses for not doing the job. When we tell them, why don't you do dawa? They say, inshallah, when we get the knowledge, we start doing dawa. The time will never come. If you think you'll wait till you become like Sheikh Didad and then start doing dawa, the time will never come. Our beloved Prophet said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, Balli go aniwala aya. Propagate even if you know one verse. Even if you know one verse about Islam, as long as you know it correctly, you have to do your job. At least the Muslims know there is one God. At least tell that. We know about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the messenger. He's the last and final messenger of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. At least tell that. If they ask you the question, how do you prove it? If you don't know, come back and do your homework. I've given the talk on is the Quran God's word proving that it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I've given the talk on Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the various world religious scriptures. Come home and do your homework. In this way, inshallah, Allah will help you and you'll be able to convey the message of Islam. Some Muslims come and tell me, the brother Zakir, first we want to make the Musalman pakka Musalman. We want to make the Muslims practicing Muslims and then we'll do dawah to the non-Muslims. I say that time will never come. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he himself could not convince his own uncle. Do you think you're better than the Prophet? In the farewell pilgrimage, our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he told the Sahabas, there were 110,000 Sahabas, that did I deliver the message to you? And all of them said, Beishak, yes, verily you have done it. The Prophet told them that all those who are present here, deliver the message to those who are not present here. And out of 110,000 Sahaba, more than 100,000 Sahabas, they were buried outside the Arab land. Doing what? Making Musliman pakka Musliman, making Muslims practice Muslims. They went to do dawah. In Medina, 
There were Muslims who did not come for the compulsory congregation salah, did not come for the Juma salah. The Prophet said he felt like burning their homes. Yet, he sent messengers to the king of Abyssinia, king of Persia, king of Yemen, asking them to accept Islam. He did not say, first I'll make all the Muslim, 100% practicing Muslim, and then do dawah. Doing dawah is part on every Muslim. It's compulsory. But many of the Muslims tell me that when we start doing dawah to the non-Muslims, they tell us to mind your own business. I tell them, if any non-Muslim tells me to mind my business, I will say that's what I'm doing. It's the duty of every Muslim to mind other person's business as far as deen is concerned. So by doing dawah, I'm minding my business. That is my business. It is the business of every Muslim to mind other person's business as far as deen is concerned. It is fard on every Muslim to convey the message of Islam. And one of the criteria to go to Jannah, as Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Asr, chapter number 103, verse number 1 to 3, where Allah says, Wal-Asr, inna al-insana la fi khusr, illa lazin amunu wa amilu salihati wa tawasaw bil haqq wa tawasaw bil sabr. By the token of time, man is well in a state of loss, except those who have faith, those who have righteous deeds, those who exhort people to truth, that is to dawah, and those who exhort people to patience and perseverance. For any human being to go to Jannah, minimum four criteria are required. Iman, righteous deeds, dawah, and exhorting people to patience and perseverance. If any one of these are missing, you shall not enter Jannah. You may be a very good Muslim, you may be offering five times salah, you may have gone for hajj, but if you don't do dawah, you shall not enter Jannah. Only dawah is also not sufficient. All four are equally important. Iman, righteous deeds, dawah, and exhorting people to patience and perseverance. If you do not do dawah under normal circumstances, you shall not enter Jannah. If Allah wants to forgive you and put you in Jannah, that's his business. As Allah says in Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse number 116, and verse number 48, that Allah will never forgive the sin of shirk. Any other sin, if he pleases, he may forgive you. So if you don't do dawah and Allah wants to forgive you, that's a different question. But under normal circumstances, according to Surah Al-Asr, if you don't do dawah, you shall not enter Jannah. And especially to those Muslims who are living in a non-Muslim society. It's an awwal fard. It's compulsory for every Muslim to convey the message of Islam to the non-Muslim. And Allah says in the Quran, in no less than three different places, in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 33, in Surah Fatah, chapter number 48, verse number 28. And Surah Saf, chapter number 61, verse number 9, Allah says, Huwa allazi arsala rasulhu bil huda wa deen al haq li uzhirahu ala deen kulli wa la qadil mushikun. Allah has sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth so that it will prevail over all the other religions, over all the other isms, over all the other ways of life, whether it be Christianism, whether it be Judaism, whether it be Hinduism, whether it be Buddhism, whether it be communism, whether it be atheism. Islam is destined to supersede all. Kulli, master them all. Walau qadil mushikun. How much the mushrik don't like it. And enough is Allah as a witness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised that his deen will prevail, will supersede all the other ways of life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not require you and me the rubbish that we are. Allah himself is sufficient to make his deen prevail. He does not require you and me the rubbish that we are. He is giving us an opportunity to do a prophet's job and to earn a prophet's reward. I would like to end my talk by giving the quotation of the glorious Quran from Surah Fusilat. Chapter number 41, verse number 33, which says, Woman Hasanu call a mimman doil a lohi, wa amilu soliho, wa call a inna nimin muslimin. Who is better in speech than one who invites to the way of thy Lord, works righteousness, and says that I'm a Muslim? Wa akhru dawan alhamdulillah rabbil alameen.